Bugger, so I was recording all of this, and um, as I was recording it all, I realized that the iPad wasn't actually recording, so I'll just go through it very quickly again, um, because I just did this quickly after lunch. Frequency encoding is basically uh, taking a sound wave, converting it to an image, right? And uh, you'll see it's like a sort of talk thing. Because I'm going through it again, I won't ramble as much this time. Um, so yeah, we're, we're talking about like uh, taking a sound wave, sampling it at a fixed interval, say, uh, spitting it out a uh, gray value, and you get a grayscale image, right? Um, I believe it's called a RAW or a bin file in Windows. They've been around for a while. Um, to process the image, you need to basically know uh, the stride or the width of the image. Um, and then if you know the width of the image, you can basically divide the length of the signal and that will get you the height. Um, really, really simple to, to work with that. I mean, you don't even have to do it in advance if you're just sort of making the image as you go. Um, but this is super primitive and we advance over to BMP or whatever um, stuff soon. So let's say that, um, so one of the classic ways to stop drift, right? Because if you do this, you, you'll get drift very quickly is as you're processing an Im image here, whenever you hit the image, you end of image, you do what we call a horizontal sync, um, and to indicate to move the, um, the print head or the screen head to the new line or whatever. It happens very fast. A lot of people know about V-Sync or V-Blank, um, that tends to come at the end. But yeah, horizontal sync at the end of the line. Um, right, so processing this image, um, you could just do that as raw values, but what the other thing you could do is you break it down to numbers, right? Let's assume that the signal quality out of the volume or amplitude of the wave, you could get uh, 256 or 128, you don't know. Back in the day, modems, so like literally if you had like a uh, computer A talking to computer B and they made that horrible modem sound, um, what they're actually do doing is they're negotiating like how loud and soft so like decibels and what's your uh, what's your noise on your carrier line and things like that and basically they're negotiating how fast they can talk how slowly or fast and and what amplitude of signal right because when you're processing a signal like this uh, it's not only about like how high and low you can get and also like at what increments can you process the signal but it's also like how fast can you process the signal right um, how many hertz uh, which is literally just um, like frames. It's like one over blah and hertz. Like how often can you sample? Um, but yeah, so that's what modem's screeching noise back in the day was. Uh, but yeah, so let's assume that we can convert to uh, digital numbers. And I'm going to for now assume you can do 256. Now one of the things you can do, we need to know how to do um, the horizontal sync line, right? Like that thing there. So what if we said, oh, we need 10 control codes? Well, that means we only got 246 values or um, a data stream, because that's the other thing you can call it, a data stream, um, is 246. Well, that sucks because we've lost quite a bit um, to the control codes. Well, what if instead we said a control code was when you had a high-low, right? That's when an H-sync happened. Well, that's kind of cool. Um, so then what we say to ourselves is we say, um, okay, we're going to say that the control code literally is only one number, right? So 255 is the control code. So we only have one control code. And what that control code do does is based on the next number, right? So it means every control code is going to take uh, two bits of signal. But they're infrequent. They don't happen often, right? Most of the stuff is the data stream. So that's great. Now we've got 256 um, control codes. So we can do all kinds of different things with control codes and we don't have to stress. Right, so the other problem is, uh, let's say you're playing this on a vinyl record. Apologies, I'm just redrawing everything because it's easier to draw and talk. Um, you need to negotiate uh, the revolutions per minute, right? And even in the case of revolutions per minute, the, you might be judder or, or stutter or whatever in the record. So you need to come up with some kind of ways to synchronize this. You might not think this applies to digital use cases, but in signal processing, um, unless 
you're using very specialized tools, it's quite often that um, you will like read a little bit more tape head or a little bit less tape head or your frame rate will judder or something like that. So we need a way to sync. Now we're going to assume that we only have a single waveform to transform. In the case we have multiple um, signals, right, because a, a cable in electronics is just a waveform, right, that's just voltage. Uh, one of the things you'll often see on a multi-pin connector or multi-pin line, or if you've got like a microchip and it's got like a bunch of different um, pins, one of the pins will often call, be called the sync pin. And the sync pin, all it does is it just goes high, low, high, low, high, low. And that basically just indicates new frame, new frame, new frame, new frame, and when to, to process the data, right? So the sync pin, it's there. But we don't have multiple pins, so how are we going to do it? Well, if we're prepared to give up another one of our precious um, data points, okay? So let's say that we were to say um, 255 is the control code, right? And then we're going to say, well, we've got, uh, that means we've got 0 to 253, okay? And then we've got one extra thing. What are we going to use that one extra thing for? Well, I'll tell you. What we're going to do, instead of taking the value, instead of saying, okay, well, that's that value, that's that value, that's that value, what we can instead measure is the change each frame, right? So how much has the signal changed? So that means that we do lose a bit because if um, you have a flat line that's basically no data and it's only when the signal changes that we get data, okay? Um, so basically, oh, hold on, that's the door bell ring. I don't want to start this recording a third time. Hello? Ah, delivery's coming up. Okay, I'm just going to record while I go through this because I just want to get this done over lunch. Yeah, there we go. Delivery's coming up. Okay. So why did I say we lose a piece of data? We lose a piece of data because the signal, if it's the same as last frame, doesn't mean anything. Um, and then you'll be like, okay, well, Claire, if my signal's 100 and I want to represent the number 200... Well, I can't make the volume 300, so how does that work? Well, what it does is we just say um, the previous frame minus the current frame modulus 256, right? A modulus is basically just divide and take the remainder as your result. And then you know if it equals zero, no data, no change, right? But if it equals anything else, that's your number that you get, okay? So now you have 255 numbers to play with. You've lost one to the control code, all's good. Now, the other problem you'll see here with this waveform is you need to know like when to sample that curve because those curves are all different. And what we can do here is, oh, there we go. Delivery for me. Well, technically, it's not for me, it's my nephew. Okay, so what we can do is we can make a decision on how frequently the sample rate comes through, right? So, literally at the start, when we get the first control code, we can just do a high and a low. So, we know that the signal when we start our communication starts with 256 and then goes to zero. And to be safe, we probably want to repeat that like twice or whatever. And that will set our interval, right? And uh, then we know that the sync code is still useful, by the way, because the sync code, basically, we guarantee that in our interval will have some kind of bias. Let's say plus minus uh, 20%, right? So if our interval is one second, which is way too long in the lands of computers, then we are expecting our sync signal to be anywhere between 80% and 120% of that time frame, right? So that's kind of the way we look at it. So if the value has changed, da da da. And in reality, we won't be processing a smooth, oh, excuse me, we won't be processing a smooth signal like that. What we will be processing is a signal that looks something like this. Okay. And 
those shaky lines are really valid because, for instance, if you're dealing with voltage instead of sound, what you'll often get when you're looking at an oscilloscope is you'll get these spikes like that when they drop down and stuff. So that's more what you'll likely what you'll get. Uh, but if we're generating a tone, a similar thing happens. Um, and yeah, so that's our interval, right? And then we've got the control code there. Uh, colors. Oh yeah, I was talking about this. Um, so we could use a control code to uh, do the horizontal sync. That's an obvious one. We could also do a control code to reset to zero, which is super useful, like the top left of the canvas, say. Um, color change. We could literally um, only change color with a control code. You'd be like, oh, well, isn't that really inefficient? Well, one of the things you could do uh, quite often in a lot of these things, we find out that um, we encode blocks of... Um, so in this case, we've got four two by two pixels, right? What we do is for each individual pixel, we store a different value. But then for the whole block, we only store the human saturation, what a lot of people would call the color, right? And this would be like the darkness or lightness or luminance or value or whatever you talk about it. Different ways of encoding the same data. Because um, it turns out light and dark changes a lot more often than color, right? So what you could literally do is you could have a, a code for changing hue and saturation, but then value changes on the signal. That's a way you could do it. You could also uh, literally just have 254 colors. You could literally have indexed, indexed color. You could even build a table map at the start to say what your specific 256 palette is, right? So that's like GIF and things like that. What you can also do is you can build, you could do 8-bit embedding color where you take, um, why 8-bit? Because 255 is 8-bits uh, and thing. You could literally like take two bits per color and you'd have two left over. Uh, well, not two whole left over because you got the control code and stuff. But yeah, there's that. Um, if you look at EGA and CJ, you'll, you'll get that. Ironically, I was just talking about Bayer filters here because cameras will actually do a similar thing where uh, on their sensors, they'll have two sensors for green and only one or for blue and red because there's more green in our world and our eyes see more green. Likewise, when you're associating um, data precision with red, green and blue channels, you can actually uh, dedicate more to say the green channel. Um, yeah, you'll see a flip of this, by the way, in um, some monitors because blue LEDs are brightest where they double up on blues and stuff. Anyway, there's lots of these kind of encodings. The important thing is um, don't be naive about your color, right? Like, yeah, you could literally take a red, blue and a green channel and you could map them to grayscale images and you could overlay those images. It works. Um, that is how the, you'll get the highest quality of color with no compression, uh, but it'll also mean your data streams are, are quite chunky and quite big. Um, so that would be like the, the full fat naive approach, which will get you the most color. Um, but yeah, and then past this, you could look at uh, a whole bunch of encoding and compression schemes and stuff. But those are kind of the basics. Uh, questions and comments? I could write some little Python to show people um, what I'm talking about here. It's a, it's a pretty well topic. The reason I was quickly making some of kind of videos is people have done some cool stuff with uh, dreams and converting um, sound to pictures. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to talk about this stuff because it's been in my head for a while. Um, most of the stuff is like basic electronics and stuff. And as I say, if you're really interested in the complex versions of this, um, look at Fourier. Um, Fourier? Am I spelling that right? I think I'm spelling that right. Fourier encoding, uh, decoding. Like Fourier is just like blah. <laughs> that whole area of math is super interesting to all of this um, section. And as I say, if you just look at um, things about image encoding and decoding. Um, so yeah, like encoding. Uh, decoding and uh, compression and decompression, which are just fancy encoders and decoders. But I'm going to assume that things are quite uh, simple here. Um, yeah. Oh, and obviously here we were talking about the example where you're obviously just moving me, 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 scanning across like that. The other thing to look at is the concept of plotters. So... Um, Remember the control code stuff, right? 
or one of your control codes could literally be um, go to like go to x y or change direction or all those kind of stuff if you're curious about that by the way um, look at the ANSI control codes uh, it's for text but yeah some cool stuff there yeah I hope that's interesting for peeps uh, and as I say questions in the comments go from there